Okay, this is the podcast for AP Bio Chapter 4, Part 1, which is going to cover um, the first part, which is the cell history. Exam date will be announced. This unit is Chapters 4, 5, and 6. Um, first thing you need to know is the cell theory. When I was in college, I had to memorize all three steps and actually write them out on my exam. Um, all living things are composed of cells. Cells are the basic units of structure and function. And cells only come from other living cells. There are three scientists that are credited with the cell theory, and they are Schleiden, who also discovered that um, all plants are made of cells. You have Schwann, who discovered that all animals are made of cells. And then you have Virchow, who discovered that cells come from other cells. There are other scientists that you need to know. Weissman, he found out that all cells can be traced back to a common ancestor. Leeuwenhoek, he was a lens maker, invented the first good microscope, and he discovered that all bacteria are made of cells. Robert Hooke was the first one to see a cell through a microscope. And Francisco Reddy disproved the theory that life comes from non-living things. It was called the spontaneous generation theory. In Francisco Reddy's experiment, he set up three sets of jars, one with an open lid, one with a tight lid, and one with a netted lid. And then he had the same type of meat, same size of meat, everything else was controlled in there. The only thing that was different was what he manipulated was his lids. After a certain amount of time, obviously the jar that was open, there were maggots all over the meat. And the tightly sealed jars, there were no maggots in the meat. And the one with the net cloth, they were just on the top. So if the spontaneous generation theory was true, that life comes from non-living things, such as maggots come from meat, which people believed back in the day, then there would have been maggots inside this jar. But there was not. So Francisco Reddy actually proved a theory wrong. Um, cells are a living thing. All cells have um, compartments, and they're, they can separate contents away from their environment. Um, so all cells contain a DNA-based information system. All cells can do homeostasis. All cells have metabolism. All cells can reproduce, which is a growth and increase in numbers. All cells respond to stimuli. All cells can move. And all cells can evolve and adapt. If you remember from chapter one, um, these are properties of life. And all cells exhibit these properties. Um, another thing to know is that cells are small. If you look here, you would need an electron microscope to see an atom, amino acids, proteins, and then some organelles here, ribosomes, um, really small bacterial cells. You can barely see with a light microscope, but we'll be able to do it. On um, viruses, we can't see in class. So you need an electron microscope to do that. But if you look at um, a red blood cell or a skin cell, and you can see the size in relation to the other things, um, what, and what you can see with the human eye, the light microscope, and the electron microscope. Um, most cells are about one micrometer to one millimeter in diameter, and some of them are bigger. All right, another thing about size of a cell, and I don't want to look at, is surface area to volume ratio. So suppose we have three cells, and let's say that they're in cube size, one millimeter, two millimeters cube, and a four millimeter cube cell. And I want to look at surface area and volume and then take a ratio of that. So first thing we're going to do is calculate surface area for these three cubes. Um, surface area, you learned in geometry, is the number of sides times the length squared. So in a one millimeter cube, there are six sides times one squared, which is six millimeters squared. In a two millimeter cube, it would be six times two squared or 24 millimeters squared. Six times four squared for the four millimeter cube would be 96 millimeters squared. So it makes sense that the larger cell would have the biggest surface area. Now let's look at volume, which is length cubed. In a one millimeter cubed, it would be one cubed or one millimeter cubed. In the two millimeter cube, it is two cubed or eight millimeters cubed. And in the four millimeter cube, it is four cubed or 64 millimeters cubed. So it makes sense that the larger cube has the most volume as well. Now let's look at the ratio of this. If I take the ratio for the one millimeter cubed of surface area over volume, it is six to one. If I look at the two millimeter cubed, it is 24 to eight, and I can reduce that to three to one. And then if I look at the biggest cell, 
96 to 64, I can reduce that to 1 and a half to 1. So overall, the ratio of surface area to volume, the smaller cube has the greatest surface area to volume ratio. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, the small size is very beneficial to them. The smaller the cell, the greater the surface to volume ratio. This makes cells more efficient because they can get the food and the nutrients that they need in an efficient manner quickly and they can get rid of their waste in a timely manner. Smaller cells also allow for cell specialization, which is how cells become different types of cells and do different functions. Okay, um, cellular structures have evolved over time because of a need for a particular function. So looking at that property of evolve, um, here's some examples of how cells have changed. Neurons now have axons to transfer information to other cells. Sperm evolved in, to have whip-like tails that enable them to swim fast. Eggs have large quantities of nutrients so they can aid in early embryo development. Okay, looking at the early history of the microscope. Um, if you don't know who that guy is, you should. His name is Robert Hooke. And he first observed cells in cork. So he took a thin slice of the cork in 1665, looked under it, looked under a really poor microscope actually, and this is actually his picture that he saw. He saw all these little compartments, and he looked, they looked like his room, and so he, that's how he came up with the word cell. He did not realize at the time that these little cells or rooms were actually living. Um, another guy that you should know is this guy right here with the curly hair. His name is Anton Leeuwenhoek, and he was a lens maker. And as you can see, this was a very first good microscope that he came up. He actually held it up to your eye, and there's the lens right there. Um, his microscopes were very small, but they were extremely good quality. He um, also saw these things under a microscope. He called them animalcules, um, unicellular organisms, but he did not realize that they were actually bacteria, and this was in 1670. Um, his skill of lens making was not passed on. Microscopes did improve in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Improvements in microscopes um, have come about because of improvement in glass making and grinding. Um, combining that with chemical knowledge and allowed us to see cellular details. Um, they got, we also got better at fixation techniques of immobilizing and killing organisms, staining them, and that and allowed us to now study histology and cytology. Um, two terms that you need to know about the microscope. Magnification is the ratio of the observed size to the actual size. It allows the observer to see detail. The maximum magnification on most light microscopes are 1,000x. Resolution is also important. You know this if you have a camera or a phone camera. Resolution is the smallest distance two objects can be separated and observed to be distinct. It is critical to produce usable, interpretable images. Um, resolution is dependent on the wavelength of light. The shorter the wavelength, the better the resolution. So blue light has the best resolution. Okay, there are different types of microscopes. This is a dissecting microscope. As you can see, the lens is really large here. It allows the user to see 3D images. It's useful for surgeries and dissections. Um, it's very well made and it has an adjustable magnifying system. It's good for studying overall structure. It's just okay for looking at cells. The light microscope, you are responsible for knowing all of the parts. Um, this is the ones we'll use in class. Um, you'll have a light source here. Diaphragm, which is underneath the stage, adjusts the amount of light. Stage clips are used to hold the slide in place. Ours is a mechanical stage clip system, so it looks a little bit different than that. Um, then you have your objectives. Low objective is the shorter one. Higher objectives are the longer ones. This has a magnification for us 10, 40, and 100. And then you always multiply by that, that by the eyepiece lens, which is 10x. So 10 times 10 is 100x for our low power. 40 times x or 10x is our 400x or um, medium or high power, and then our highest power is 1,000x. You change the objectives by the nose piece, which revolves the objectives around. This body tube is important because it separates this lens from this lens and allows us to see the image at the correct distance. Um, this top lens, which is 10x, is the, called the ocular lens or the eyepiece. The arm is used as a handle. The stage holds the slide. 
You have two knobs for um, adjusting the microscope. The course adjustment knob is used on low power. Otherwise, it might hit the slide if you're using it on high power. The fine adjustment knob is your smaller one. You only use it on high power. And then the bottom is your base, and that is used um, to support the microscope and also used to carry the microscope down. There are also microscopes called fluorescent microscopes, as seen here. Um, it's much like the light microscope, as you can see. It kind of looks a little bit similar. Um, but it sends the light down on the objective to excite fluorescent molecules. This excitation allows the fluorescent molecules to actually glow. And then they can, if they see them, then they can label the molecules. Um, cells can be dead or alive, depending on the application and what you're using it for. Then we have the electron microscope, and hopefully one day when you go to college, you guys will be able to use one. Um, it uses beams of electrons, boiled off hot filaments, to form the images. The magnification is awesome. It's 500,000 times an electron microscope can get up to. A lot different than the light microscope, which is only 1,000x. Excellent resolution. The images come out clear, such as that spider. Um, you can see all the details of the, the hairs and the eye structures as well, and it's the fangs. Um, there are two types of electron microscopes. The TEM is the transmission electron microscope. For this, they use a thin section of a sliced tissue or cell that's stained with metal atoms. The electron beam is absorbed and deflected by the metal. The image you get is a shadow. Um, the film developed is in black and white, and then it can be printed off. The scanning electron microscope, or SEM, looks at the surface of a specimen, like, such as this insect. Um, the surface is coated with a metal. The primary beam hits and scans over the surface. And then it reads these electrons and scans the surface. And then you can see that. Here's a comparison of a light microscope to the electron microscopes. You do not need to learn the parts to the electron microscope. This is just used as a comparison to see how much more complex the electron microscopes are to the light microscope. Um, cells and non-cells. Life has made enormous changes to the Earth. The Earth is covered with many different forms of life, and there's non-living materials that are of biological origin, but they are not alive. It is very important to understand the difference between an actively living cell and a biological but non-living thing. So we'll be talking about that. But just remember right now that living things are made of cells always. You need to have at least one cell in order to be considered a living thing. Um, and with that, we're going to be talking about here, this is what we're talking about. Viruses are not alive. They are not made of cells and when we do do a whole unit on viruses um, but they are not alive because they don't contain cells they actually contain chemicals but they are dependent on cells for their existence um, they have a protein capsid compartment that contains a bit of a nucleic acid like DNA or RNA as an information system here's a picture um, the capsid is what's around it and then inside is a DNA or RNA strand and that completes our podcast for Chapter 4, Part 1.